Welcome to Primetime at the Library. Primetime at the Library is a great event with your friend at the Library and many offices on the campus, whose mission is to encourage lifelong learning beyond the classroom for the entire Bethel community. Tuesday, April 3rd, join us as we work with Tim Essenberg of the Business Department for a conversation entitled Reconciliation at Bethel CAS. Bethel CAS. Today, Dr. Jay Rasmussen presents part two of the series. Are your students learning? Crafting well designed traditional assessment. Well, let me be sure you can hear me here. <laughs> no, this will be good. Um, this is Nathan, you were the first one to say. There's, we'll be doing one more after this, it'll be on the 19th, and then we'll be looking at uh, performance assessment. And, uh, hi, Angela. If, um, if you're comfortable, why don't you kind of slide up in here a little bit? And you don't necessarily have to sit next to me. This is going to be a more intimate conversation. Okay. Got it all the way to the light. The light's not. This is um, this is the second in a three-part series. Yeah, I think you were here for the first one too, didn't you? Okay. So the third part will be on performance assessment. Then today is going to be a little focus on traditional assessment. And uh, it's good because we got a got a small group here. Um, in terms of what what I hope you can take out of it today, it's going to identify the more. It's called learning chart. And uh, should be able to explain you know, what are some appropriate uses for traditional assessment. And I'd like us to take our thinking beyond the obvious. There are some obvious things, but let's, let's kind of go beyond that. And then um, I'd like us to think a little bit, but I'm going to share some research on what some problems are in the CAFs. Um, there are some very strange issues that you know, come up with. teacher made, professor made, yes. And then we'll look at some common clues. You know, for what we just call test wise students. These are the students that have learned how to play the game, you know, but they may not necessarily know the content, but they've learned how to really play the game in some ways. And then we'll look uh, kind of fourth um, it just really how to go about writing you know, high quality traditional um, assessment. What I will say on that last one. Um, there's the thing that's interesting with this one in particular is that there, there really is a body of knowledge that's helpful to know about writing good traditional assessment articles. And I think much of what happens with teaching can be really intuitive. And I think you've got some phenomenal teachers that probably have never had an ed class in their entire life. They just they figure it out you know, intuitively. Writing good traditional assessment items, writing good assessments is not one of those things that you just will get completely by intuition. You know, there is, a, there is a body of knowledge. There are some things that are particularly helpful. And actually, professional test writers, there are people that make a living you know, doing this very thing. You know, they might turn out an eight-hour day. They might turn out maybe 10 items. That's if somebody doesn't know the content we've got to do that. They've got to put the items together. You know, there's a real specific body of knowledge for writing the items. And often what we get in test banks, the things that come to us, are often not prepared by professional writers. They're often prepared by grad students, believe it or not. You know, they're working for some professor, they wrote some book someplace, and uh, we assume that these are you know, professionally you know, crafted items, and they often aren't. So on this one, we'll be taking a look at what are some of those real kind of do's and don'ts, and how to, how to really write these items well. So when I talk traditional assessment, this is really what I'm talking about. 
uh, the idea that with traditional assessment, usually there's just some selection that's taking place. You know, so they're selecting a true or false, and they're selecting a short answer, a matching a multiple choice. Okay. There are some people that will put essay items in the camp of a traditional item. And I would say, to me, that makes sense depending on the kind of essay item. Okay, there are certain essay items that are called restricted response essay items, and that's where it's something very specific to look for. It's almost like an expanded short answer. So I would say a restricted response essay item would fall in the traditional assessment. If you've got a more extended response essay, you know, then that's going to fit more in that performance category. So today, when we're talking traditional assessment, we're really talking the idea of you've got to select something. That's pretty much what you're doing. Or maybe writing just a little bit. Performance assessment, it's often called authentic assessment, sometimes alternative assessment. That is really about a student really kind of shaping, really creating something. Often there's synthesis that goes on, going on, really, you know, they're pulling back on things that more the knowledge level comprehension level. They're putting things in the Traditional assessment. So let's let's come back to us with the question. Then. So I'm just going to give you a chance to, to get get in your mind here what you think are some of the purposes you know, of traditional assessment. And I'm going to give you some time to think. And like I said, I want us to think beyond the obvious a little bit with it. So what what would be some appropriate uses? Why would you use traditional assessment? Just think a little bit. Starting to find now too is you're going to you're going to see fewer and fewer students that have, ex that have experienced a lot of traditional assessment. You know, K12 schools are going to a lot more performance assessment now, and you literally will have some students coming that are not familiar with kind of how to play the game of multiple choice and true false and matching and how to do some of those types of things. Oh, you when want you to move it over there? Put it on that. Often the traditional assessment is a very different. They don't understand the rules of how to play this game. So it can, it's real life practice you know, for board certification or you know, whatever it might be. So, their usage. My 
Some assessment is better than no assessment. Because if you think the only thing I can ever do is performance assessment, you've got a class of 45 people, and you're probably not going to do many assessments. They're not going to get a lot of feedback throughout that course. So it fit well with those larger classes. Other thoughts? With this? Kind of going along with, with that, it, it, it helps you keep students up to date through the semester. Um, you mentioned the formative, but if it's done regularly, then it, students don't fall behind, or if they, they shouldn't fall behind. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's an accountability factor to it. It's accountability that kind of for them, so they can see if they're on track with what's going on in the course. But also, it's nice accountability for you to find out, am I really getting across what I need to know make being successful? Informative again in a sense too. But students really appreciate it when they have a sense of how they're doing in your course. They get very nervous and they're not comfortable when they're halfway through the course or three quarters of the way through and they don't know how they're doing. It's not a comfortable feeling for them. But I think it, it could often really spark additional study on their part too when they find out, hey, I'm not quite where I need to be on this thing. You know, so it could be a motivational tool to some degree to all of a sudden better get with this now. I'm not kind of where I should be at this point in time. You know, so it's a little bit of that, you know, a little bit of that stick type thing. You know, not just the carrot, but the little, the little stick part too. It might be necessary you know, for some of those things too. Well, let's let's move a little bit. We could keep going on this, you know, in some way. But I guess the point is that there's there's really a lot of uses. You know, there's some inappropriate uses for sure, but there's a lot of appropriate uses. You know, I think the traditional assessment. I'm, I'll just tip my hand right now. I'm a person that really takes a balanced view of assessment. You would think, as an ed prof, I'd say everything has got to be performance assessment. I don't believe it. I really don't. I think there's times that traditional assessment is more appropriate you know, than performance assessment. But the key is knowing when to use it you know, and, then, and then doing it well you when know, you actually do it. You know, generally speaking, like we were talking about it, what Angela mentioned, knowledge comprehension level. You know, um, this, I would say this is, this is where the bulk of your traditional assessment is going to fall. And I would say, I would say this, I would say you're actually wasting time if you're using a bunch of performance assessment just to measure this. Performance test assessments take much longer, they're harder to put together, longer to score, that kind of thing. I think what you need is the most efficient forms of assessment you can get. So for some of these lower level, you know, the traditional assessment can be really strong. The one, the one item type that is considered traditional assessment that you can actually jump up on Boone's Dead's on it is, is a multiple choice item. And you can write multiple choice items where you actually are taking students up into that synthesis level, evaluation level. Um, in fact, I don't use multiple choice items to measure lower level things. I usually go another item type. They're hard to write. But you can you can write multiple choice items that are requiring those thought processes, the analysis, synthesis, evaluation. Now they're hard to write, they're tricky, but you can get at some higher level as well. So I want to pick up on this this idea of, of formative assessment a little bit more too, because I do think it's a powerful use of traditional assessment. You know, just the fact that the student is having a chance to find out where they're at. And you're having a chance to find out where they're at and how we need to monitor and adjust you know, what's, what's going on. And I'm just going to share a couple little uh, pieces of research here. A guy named Rick Stiggins, who's a big, big assessment guy, says this. It's an interesting distinction. We'll take a look through it here. So when you have traditional assessment items, whether it's true, false, matching, multiple choice, whatever, it, um, it's really the use of those items that determine if you've got formative assessment or if you've got summative assessment. 
And I would contend that for the most part, you know, unless it's at the absolute end of the course, that you really want things to be formative assessment. And by that I mean after you've given a true false, true false items or matching multiple choice, whatever, if you just hand it back to the students, they look at it, and you just move on your merry way, and nothing happens as a result of that, then I would say you have some of the assessment. Okay. It's when you start taking a look, doing some error analysis, like where did they have problems? You know, what, what are the items that were most common in this? That's where you come back and you'll spend a little time on that, you know, helping them really understand those things. I'm oversimplifying, but, but what I'm saying is with your traditional assessment, really look to use it for everything it's capable of. And that would be really the formative assessment. And I see, honestly, I see quite a few profs that don't, that don't take advantage of their traditional assessment. It is a summative assessment, even though we're a week into the class, or two weeks into the class. It has potential of being a powerful learning tool if you just take a little bit of time to work with it. Some interesting research here, there's this guy named Willen, who's um, in 2007 um, published some work here. And this particular study, uh, this is a K-12 study. You don't find a lot of college studies on assessment. But um, this particular study was based on 400 uh, independent studies that we worked with. This was a meta-analysis and uh, spanning about a 40-year period of time. And what he concluded after looking at all of these studies is that you can, with formative assessment done well, you can almost double the speed of student learning. I'm just going to take a quick example. Of, I'm going to pick on Sarah here, but I've watched her teach. She uses clickers quite a bit in her class, and she uses a lot of multiple choice items. So she'll, she probably had one. Why don't you talk about it, Sarah? Like how long you teach, how you use the clickers, how that's formal assessment. Let's just give an example. So I'll so. teach about a five to seven minutes, and we go on to the I'll close up the question and ask them to have that section. Oftentimes, I'll look at the individually first, and then I can look at the histogram of their responses. It looks like more than 80% of them are on track or the response, but if it's really divided, and what the last thing is to talk to somebody and clarify their thinking and talk through the answer choices and see which ones you can eliminate as a problem solving um, skill there, and then I'll ask them to re vote, and then I'll show them the two graphs before and after they can see the effect of working together and processing more in the longer they process the material, they're likely to converge on the answer that's more correct. And then I'll ask one of them to explain why, why did you converge on that one. And then I'll explain their, their thinking and their reasoning, which gives me, not only can they choose the right answer, but why are they making that choice, which has been really helpful. I've seen you too do it where when students go into the quicker question, it's a traditional assessment item, it's a multiple choice item. When they go into it, if she sees a lot of people wrong with it, she'll try to get the students talking about it, but then she will clarify things too. And she might back up on something she taught before. It's a classic case of formative assessment. <coughs> so by the time they leave that last, that clicker question, then everybody's on the right page. They're pretty well set, they're pretty well ready to perform. If you don't want to use clickers, um, what I'll do oftentimes is I'll just put a, I'll put a multiple choice item up on the, on the overhead or PowerPoint or whatever, and then have everybody just um, either individually or with a partner decide is this A, B, C, or D. Just want you to say and find out how many people thought it was A. Get his hand because how many thought it was B, C, or D, whatever. And then I let them know, you know, what the correct answer was. And you can find out how far off we are. Do I need to say much now? Are we on the same page here? Um, this kind of stuff works well with kind of knowledge level, comprehension level things. Obviously, opinions don't work well, you know, for this type of thing. But that's a very simple form of assessment that you know, can be pretty uh, I'm sorry to uh, answer the back up here, but what kind of classrooms do you have to have to use clickers? Any classroom at Bethel? Okay, I need to ask you about the technology of that. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, we've got a video of Sarah using clickers. Okay. All right. And, yeah. okay. It's one on assessment, and uh, I was born with that. 
house and I was down watching how she uses clippers. And she was in a class, I don't know, probably 40, 45 students. It was packed. And she's now 60. Yeah. And dealing with some pretty heavy duty content. And everybody was into what was going on. And she would teach a little bit, like she said, five, six, seven, eight minutes. And then boom, there's a question there. They know their group, they're in their group, they're talking, they're clicking in. And then it's just moving fast. Everybody was in it. She was comfortable. She's going to do a workshop with the faculty development in the fall. You know, just clickers. Or just come watch her. I've used clickers on occasion, and I've actually found that it's the most useful thing I can do. That's a good idea. That, that was kind of, you know, I, I try and do exam reviews on Fridays and then yep. exams on Mondays, and that would be a really good opportunity for students to know, you know, here's the thing that you focus and also put my time on. Yep. So yep. Again, yeah, you put importance on certain things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great thing. So it, it seems like it would work. Maybe better in more direct classes. I mean, if they're just one class, say ten. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it would be? I think it's still helpful. Okay. I would put them in partners then, where they've got to talk to their partner about it. it I think it only works well where there's a lot of um, kind of absolute right and wrong answer type things. I think it's a little better for that. You can use it to spark discussion, just to see where people are at on certain things. You can do it that way. Mm -hmm. Correct me on that. Is that? Well, yeah, I've used it in smaller classes. It depends on the night. You might see students that have four hundred couple of students. The most students, they know each other. They've been in the same cohort. They're not going to feel afraid to have, like to raise their hand if I chose A. If there's ten people, you might actually be the only one who chose A. They might feel comfortable to do that. If you're dealing with those kind of students that doesn't know each other well, then they're going to be very timid to put that to put their hand up. Where if they click, it's completely anonymous. Nobody knows what their data are. And on the set of clickers are determined as yeah, there's a no question mark button. Where, like, if you're just full of spots, you very discreetly you know, the question mark button and on, on the professor's display it pops up saying someone's very I usually just there, choose you know. an answer choice that isn't an option. Like, I choose E and there's no E. Yeah. It seems that, I mean, from my ex I have seen this at like parent meetings and stuff like this. So I guess they're using it on Is it used more uh, right now than? for say elementary or uh, it's not being used a ton at the elementary level. You'll find it a little more middle school, high school level. You can find it there. But uh, yeah. like with smart boards for example, there are clicker sets that go with smart boards. I watched a fourth grade math lesson not long ago that used clickers. It was phenomenal what those kids were doing. You know, that they're coming with that that understanding. Yeah. And then just another thought on this. This was a Williams study a little bit earlier in 1998. We looked at 250 different studies. But again, I think it speaks to that power of formative assessment. I've heard other researchers that will say more so than any other educational intervention that you can do, formative assessment done well gives you your biggest bang for the buck. For the the importance of that feedback on the learning process. Okay. All right, let's turn in your package. Uh, I'm going to partner you two. Uh, I'm going to partner you two, and you two are going to have to work together. And even if you don't like her, you're gonna, you are going to have to work with her. All right, so I want you to take a look at number one. And, uh, you can kind of whisper if you want to hear with your partner. But I want you to decide now if you think that's an I have to talk to the person. I can't work in yeah, don't want them to steal our <laughs> No, you guys are clearly right. And they show them wrong. That's true. Let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
perhaps we're coming out of a class where a test had been given of some sort. Okay. What, what kind of complaints do you think you might hear from students? Well, they might not be complaining, but they do sometimes. So what complaints, what kind of common problems do you think you might hear? Or think about for you as a student, what, do you, what really irked you, you know, when it came to you know, taking traditional assessments? Let's just make a guess here. What's the most common problem? Uh, true, false, or multiple choice questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A clear, yeah. and correct answer. Okay. Yeah. So the prop is asking for a clear, correct answer, and then you that. Okay. Other problems. Comment that uh, there is so much detail that wasn't emphasized in class, or wasn't didn't seem important. Right. So you'll hear it go both ways. You'll hear them. I hear them say this too. Yeah, and I, when I talk to classes, I hear them say this. We were being assessed on something that really was not taught very much. There wasn't much focus to it. All of a sudden, this assessment is loaded up with this. Or the prof spent a lot of time on this. We thought this would be really important. Then all of a sudden, there's like one or two items. We get really ticked off about that. Okay. What other kind of things? I 
are about poorly worded in this case. It's kind of a little bit what Nathan's talking about. But items that just are not clear. Yeah, I'll just kind of show you real quick what some of the research shows with it. It does, it does show that often um, traditional assessment items are particularly shallow, that, that they're just going for minutia. In fact, I heard this comment yesterday in the classroom. Because, uh, that it felt like it was trivial pursuit. Okay? You can use traditional assessment you know, to measure important concepts. You can do that. You can also use it to measure little detail things that support those concepts. So oftentimes, too much attention on the really easy to write questions, the ones that have got very obvious answers, but, but they may not represent something that might be even more important in some ways. Also found just ambiguous question, a little bit, a little bit what you were saying, but the student is honestly not sure what the question is. Like when we write these things, it's perfectly clear to us. I mean, it really is. But then all of a sudden we start hearing how somebody else thinks about it. All of a sudden, I see what you mean. You know, that is just not really clear. And here's a yeah. weird one. Here's a weird one. Um, excessive wording. And often, when we write these things, we often think, if I use more words, I will be more clear. And often, it's the inverse. So just being a little bit careful with that. And then extremes and difficulty. Either everything being too easy, which has the effect of nobody really studies much because they know they don't need to read during a bunch of anything. Or I'll see them sometimes, and research shows sometimes teachers will intentionally make them too difficult. And then it starts to send the message that, you know, don't even bother to study because we're going to get killed on this, you know, no matter what happens. So that idea of trying to find some kind of balance between ease and, you know, ease and difficulty with it. Right. The fifth one, um, Instructors picking the wrong item format. And when I say format, what I mean is like true, false, or matching, or multiple choice. Every item format has a strength. And, and you, you've got a packet, I'll kind of show you some of these things. But there are advantages and disadvantages for every type of item type. So what might work well as a multiple choice item might not work well as a matching item. You need to know what each of these formats is really designed to do. And then, the inadequate planning one, I'm sure we can all relate to this, but you know, especially beginning teachers, that's the deal where you teach in the class the first time, you know you've got to get the test, it's the night before you get the test, it's night o'clock at night, you're writing this test, and you know, it's just not the kind of plan that's going to be that you need. I really believe, much like a good lesson, that a good assessment, and I think it takes almost three times of using it before you get the bugs really work out. And then the last one, no small issues, but the issue of validity. And I think a good synonym for that is accuracy and then and reliability. A good synonym, I think, is consistency for that. And with validity, often the biggest issue is what's called content validity. That's what these two were talking about. The content validity has to do with how well you sample what's been taught in class. And often what happens when we give a traditional assessment, we tend to most remember what we last taught. So like that week or two weeks before, three weeks, we remember that. But maybe the assessment's spanning a six week period of time. We often don't pay as much attention to what was in that earlier, you know, the first week or second week or whatever. So you run into the content validity issues when you're not adequately sampling you know, everything this time. Generally, the more attention, more time you spend on something, it should be represented you know, in your assessment in some way. There should be more items, more weight in your opinion in some way. So these are, these are some problems. Um, with, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do a quick demo here on some problems with essay items. And I just want you to watch what I'm gonna do here. So, so tell me what kind of problems are you seeing here? And these are actually are some, some research-based problems. The class, is, the class is finished up right now. Um, we've got an essay exam. This is going to be the final, the final score um, for the class. And um, I'm a big believer in essays, and I write them really, really well. So I, I think it's perfectly fine that they just have one essay exam for, you know, for their final grade. Then. So let's get started with it. Um, this, is be good. this one is really creatively written. Adds that, that Shannon, that Shannon's a really creative writer. This one's an A. Here, here. 
Okay. This looks like it's a pretty long paper. It's that Richie guy. Yep. <laughs> he likes to talk. He likes to write. Well written. A lot of citations in here. This is long. You know, I, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm sure it's in there. All the content's got to be. That one's an A. C. What time is my Timberwolf game on? Seven. Do they have a chance of making the playoffs? Probably not. C. Ten to seven. C. D. It's a bunch of C's and D's. A. C minus. Uh, here's that Nathan's paper. I absolutely love that guy. Just that clean cut image. I know his dad. Young up and coming star. This has got to be good. A. Okay. Punctuation. Where is it? Have you heard of periods? Have you heard of commas before? D. C. D. One minute to go. Yep. <laughs> All right, so what did you see here? The student's nightmare, okay, there's more truth to, to fiction than some of this. What did you see? What was going on? They're being judged on who the student was and what they actually For sure. Mm -hmm. I, had, I, had no, I had nothing, no criteria that I was looking at. I had no key whatsoever. What, did, what else was happening? What else was happening? Okay, time factor. I certainly did not allow enough time to do it. But you notice what happened to the grades as I moved further in the process? They got lower. Yeah, that will, there's research showing that will tend to happen too. The ones scored later in the stat tend to not do as well as the ones earlier. Okay, what else do you see? Okay, inconsistency. Okay. I was scoring longer papers higher than shorter papers. There's research showing that the longer, they've done studies on this, identical content, a shorter paper, longer paper, longer paper will score more content. Okay, that was there. Punctuation issues affected what was going on. Now that could be appropriate, it depends, you know, but you've got to lay out what your criteria is. You know, is it important, is it not important? Kind of I actually just created an essay thing yesterday. Okay. Um, and there was one problem where I ran into a student answer where the student acted like I had a list of here are things that I want to see yeah. on an answer to this question. Yeah. And according to the checklist, he actually had everything. Yeah. But on a one page essay, he wrote three lines mm -hmm. and it was sentence fragments. And I think he was just out of time at the end of the exam. And I ran into that and like, well, mm -hmm. um, based off of what what you say I have here, it looks like he understands the concept, but he often not write an essay. Yeah. And I, I was kind of thrown on what I'm going to do with this. Yeah. You know, he probably should get a higher score than someone who wrote a lot that clearly didn't understand the essay, but he didn't write an essay. Yeah. So. so as you go back, that's a classic case of kind of tweak that a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, if it's important that you have complete sentences, then say it. The other thing that was coming into play is called the halo effect. It's one of the things that you have. Know, it's that having an image of a certain student you figure they're going to be great. Okay, so that's that's an issue that comes into play as well too. So there's some, some different things in that. This is going to have to be one of the workshops that's uh, <laughs> we're we're you know we're we're out of time with it. But let's um, let's come back let's come back to your um, I call it anticipation guy. Let's come back to that real quick. And then I just want to show you something that you can take with you. I think will be real, real practical. This is page one. This is that one you worked on with the, with the partner then. Get that one. Get the first one, matching item types, especially effective um, at measuring terms, definitions, dates. That one is a great. That honestly is about all matching is very good for. Okay, I'm just being honest with you. It's good for those, those types of things. Um, the second one about being diagnostic, um, that is a great. You can use it in particular in mathematics because what you can do is figure out how somebody might think wrong about a particular thing. And if you're working out incorrect answers, you use that, that line of thinking, uh, arrive at whatever that answer is. And it can be diagnostic because you can see who that B here, which was really a wrong way of thinking about it. So it, um, it can be. 
there's your four multiple choice items, every A, B, C, D, every one of those should be plausible in some way. And generally speaking, you try to do error analysis. You think, how are they likely to go off on this? And that's what you're, they're called distractors. That's what distractors are. Um, the third one, um, um, essay is not their favorite type. Certainly some students, for sure, especially English majors, you know, they love them. But generally speaking, multiple choices. Now, why that's important, I don't know. How it's useful, I don't know exactly, but multiple choice items are the students' favorite. But true false items can cover a large material, large amount, a short period, that is true. The average true false item will take a student about 50 seconds or so to work. Average multiple choice item, it doesn't matter if it's a kid or an adult, it's about 75 seconds. So if you can use true false to cover you know, basic material, you can actually get more items in. But you can actually figure out how much time I should allow for an exam. You know, if you think 50 seconds true false, 75 seconds multiple choice, and that's a reasonable amount of time to Multiple choice can effectively measure different levels of thinking. That is one of them. The one about true false being most susceptible to ambiguity, uh, that, that one is true. You know, often it's because the thought is not completed in the true false side. Uh, no, three was three was false. So with multiple choice, you actually are completing a thought. You lay it out there and it's being completed. So, so they are they are I think some of the true false some of the trickiest to write. Um, seven multiple choice are the most difficult to write because they must be clustered. That, that's a tricky item, but by uh, the answer to it is false. And what we mean by cluster is that, like when you write um, matching items, you want to cluster. You want to have all things that are date related, all things that are people related, all things that are terminology related. You want those clustered. You're trying to not give away clues that, um, you know, letting them know that it's a name that you can you know, get to. Um, and on eight, true false are most influenced by guessing. That actually is true, and students will get into what's called a response pattern. And by that I mean they will look and see, I've had a lot of trues, so maybe I should have some falses here. And, you know, they, they allow that kind of thinking to shape, you know, what they do. The multiple choice has the lowest content validity. That one is actually false. The one that has the lowest content validity is essay, because with essay, it's the most time intensive to sample a large amount of material. Uh, essays are great at, at assessing synthesis, you know, as you know, but they actually are a really lousy item type to, to sample a large variety of content. It just doesn't work very well because they take so much time you know, for a student to do. And then 10, you know, they're often uh, short answers scored unfairly. Uh, it's actually the, that would be, would be disagree. The halo effect most comes into play on the essay ones. And, uh, and what the recommendations are with grading essay exams is to try to not look at the name if you can. You know, I'll have them write them on the back of things sometimes. Try not to look at the name. And as you're grading them, I think what works best, there's some research that'll show you do all of your ones first, all of number one. And you're flipping papers a lot. But you've got it in mind what you're looking for. And then shuffle your papers. Okay, and then do all of your twos. You've got your papers mixed up. And then do, shuffle your papers again, do all your threes. So that way you get rid of that idea of that sequence thing, affecting things. You also are less likely to pay attention to who the name is because you're, you're just trying to get through them. And so that's a way to kind of you know, avoid some of those issues as well too. With, um, with, the handout, with the handout packet that you've got here, um, I'm going to leave this with you, but on page two, you've got uh, some general guidelines. And I actually use this handout in an assessment class I teach, so it's written more for a K-12 world, but the principles all, you know, all hold true. These are some general guidelines that are here. And then I just want to show you what else is in here. Um, the way I broke it up, if you flip over to page three, what I did was I took each item type so we've got true false. So I talked about what the advantages are. What is it good for? What are disadvantages? 
what is it not so good for? And then um, there's some basic guidelines. This one has not very many guidelines, actually. And then, um, and then I've got just some samples there. Again, they're elementary samples, but the style of how they're put together works pretty well. You'll see some things on short answer. And then the part that I, the hardest ones I think to write really are, are good, um, good multiple choice items. There's some basic principles that are there as well too, and some some guidelines you know for writing. Um, I'm just going to show one thing real fast, and I want you to hop up and just leave you know, if you want. I, I think yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to take a few of those. Yeah, you bet. If you if you ever want me to come in to and talk with you guys about anything at all, yeah. I'd be more than happy to. Okay. Uh, are you going to talk about um, this traditional assessment? Are you going to talk about uh, the other assessment mm -hmm. with uh, performance? Exactly. Yep. April 19th. Oh, that'll okay. be the next one. that first. Yeah. Yep. No, we'll definitely. We'll definitely. where when you're explaining the assignment that you just want to be able to do. And I would even I would even use that example with them and let them know that you know you this paper it might be very, very personal, which I appreciate. I mean you're making yourself vulnerable. That's what good writing does. You know, but at the same time this paper is about layout whatever the are. We just let them know up front. But I think on the assignment they need to write down is it just about a personal story or is it about you know, some particular writing strategies you've been working So as long as you're up front with it, then I think it makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Do you want to see these last common clues? Yeah. Do you have the other visual thing here? About. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the idea with these clues is what we're trying to avoid is these clues to test by students. Because what good assessment does is it measures what a student knows, not how well they can play the game. Because you can literally get students that are test wise that will test much higher than what they really know. And then you've got some students that have a play the game that are actually more than test as much. So these are these are some common things, like the short answer. Um, you have blanks that are the same length. And students will literally think it's a long blank and a long answer here. So the general rule of thumb is we make blanks all the same length. So what I do is I figure out what's my longest answer, and that's how long all the blanks are. And some of this will apply to what you do, but some, some won't, but it's kind of interesting. So it turns out that true items are typically, there's more words in them than false items. And there are some students that actually know that. So if you had no idea you know, which were true, which were false, pick the longer ones, mark them true, the shorter ones, mark them false, you'll be right more than the um, And there tend to be, especially on teacher-made tests, more true items than false items. So again, if you don't know, no idea whatsoever, mark the true, you'll be right more than the wrong. Now, why this happens, who knows? You know, it's, forget it. But then, Anytime, anytime you use, they're called specific determiners and true false items. It's always never any of these any of these terms. The test wise student knows for the most part, you know, how do you answer those things? Basis, yeah, you say false. There's exceptions almost in everything. And then for matching, the, the big the big pitfall here is having an equal number of things, it's called the premise column, that's the column on the left, and then you've got the response column on the right. So you want to have a disproportionate number of these options. Because what a smart student does is they get the ones they know, and then by process of elimination, there's only one thing left, that's what it is. So normally you put one to two more um, options on the right-hand side of the 
is to try to avoid that. I see this violated all the time. So, and then the big things with multiple choice, um, being careful that you equally distribute the correct answers between A, B, C, and D. Um, B and C are statistically more common. And actually, C, you've probably heard this, but it's it's actually about 35% of the time on a four option multiple choice item. Okay, we'll be right. 35% of the time. It should be 25. And same thing is true false. It turns out the longest option tends to be the correct one most often. So if you knew nothing on a multiple choice item and um, you saw C as the longest option, I would say about 50% probably. You know, so it's kind of fun to go back and look. You know, I don't know if you do any multiple choice or not, but to go back and kind of look at it. Kind of that and then just a couple of final thoughts. Generally speaking, if you're using multiple choice, do you use any at all with what you do with the cover? Well, this might be a mess. Um, well, I, I, I have to do something a little bit. Um, certainly not the whole example. Like, yeah. Like for something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So everything we were talking about does kind of apply. But the idea of just going with four options, you will get enough reliability if they're all positive options. When people do those, they often write a locality, which is the way it's made. They'll have another thing to do. Very positive. Some people have two things to do. To write the tricky part of a good one. Multiple choice like this, and every, every option is possible. And then you, that's where you get your left. And then, um, well, we talked about that. And then just however you're doing it, be consistent with capital letters and periods. There's different ways of doing it. Um, this is where I have drawn the most in my multiple choice items, or any item actually. When I give the assessment, um, I go ahead and score it or we're doing that. It comes back to the student. I allow them to put a written argument on anything they missed that they feel they can make a good argument for. And especially on multiple choice or any of the other traditional things, um, they sometimes I will hear their response and I think, yeah, I can see how you thought it. It makes perfect sense. But I don't allow the, the conversation to happen in class because it just takes up a lot of time. Nobody cares unless it's like that. But I have to put a written response to it. I tell them if you want to use the book when you're doing this, that's great. How we want to do it, and then I get it. Then I get it back, and then I look at those written responses. And either I say okay or no, and I might write a little something. In the but what I do is if I see I'm getting a number of students that are kind of challenging an item in some way. Almost always there's something, there's an issue with that item. So normally I have to go back and rewrite it to get out what was written. But that single, I just started doing this. I, I just stumbled on this, nobody told me to do it. But that's what's really improved my test more than just allowing those arguments. And usually by year three then, I've got a test that's pretty solid because they've tested it. You know, they've, they've worked on it. So that's, I think it's a really helpful. And then just enough time. So many so that's very exciting. Your case is different, actually. I've got problems. Staff's problems. But it keeps me right. Yeah, it keeps me ready. And then the rest of it is just the idea of the packet. All right, I'll let you get back to your. Yeah. 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 Yeah.